Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome back to Building the Black Educator Pipeline Podcast. I'm your host, Shana Terrell. I am Director of Pipeline Programming at the Center for Black Educator Development. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I am an educator activist who's dedicated my life to fighting for freedom and liberation for my people. A native of the South Bronx, but I have been adopted by these Philadelphia streets, y'all. I am here. My organization, the Center for Black Educator Development, affectionately known as CBED. We have been exist in existence since 2019. We seek to diversify the teacher pipeline by building and rebuilding the Black teacher pipeline. Now, how do we do that? We do that by implementing a 444 model that will support aspiring educators four years in high schools, four years in college, and their first four years of teaching. And we do this work by standing on four pillars. Pipeline programming, which is strengthening pathways to teaching, developing culturally relevant pedagogy, innovative professional learning, and advocating for critical public policy. So a major shout out to all the funders and all the partners who were courageous enough to do this work, to invest in this work, and revolutionary enough to believe in us. We love you and we thank you. I also always have to give a major shout out to Citizens Ed for giving this platform and this opportunity for us to talk about the tools and the solutions to rebuild the Black teacher pipeline and giving us a platform to talk to real people doing real work and real things in this real struggle. So thank you. So though it's not Women's History Month, y'all, we are still celebrating the work of our sisters in education and rolling with the theme, the voices of Black women leaders, building the education pipeline. Today, we'll be talking to two amazing historians, researchers, authors, and freedom fighters. When we analyze the research, we find that there are tons of gaps in documenting the contribution that Black people have made to this world, especially in education. I love when there are Black women who are lifting up other Black women. Black women are the most educated group in America, but yet fall into a category of the most underpaid in comparison to their white counterparts. Black women are more likely than other groups of women and nationalities to work in the lowest paying occupation. Why is that, we ask? Because sisters are about that service and sisters are about that servant leadership. That's why. Black women are out here shining and grinding while still facing racism, sexism, and discrimination. So it's our legacy to be the backbone of our communities despite the challenges we face. So shout out to all my co-conspirators watching the show right now. I would love for you guys to like and share, of course, this podcast. But right now, if you're watching, comment in the chat. What are some unique challenges that you think Black women face in education today? I'll say that again. Comment in the chat. What are some unique challenges that you think Black women face in education today? These two women will be connect that we will be connecting with today are going to tell us all about great Black women leaders in Philadelphia that overcame challenges and helped, helped to our communities rise to greatness. My guests are co-authors of the book, They Carried Us, The Social Impact of Philadelphia's Black Women Leaders. So let me introduce first Dr. Alina M. Baker Rogers. Alina is a native of West Philadelphia who now resides in Virginia. She's a former chair and vice president of several nonprofit organizations, served on mayoral advisory committees, and as a member, as a board member and chair of Philadelphia County Assistance Office. A lifelong educator, she holds a doctorate in higher education leadership, a former university administrator, assistant professor of educational research. Alina is also a past recipient of the Jane S. Abrams and Cecil B. Moore Community Service Award. Next to the stage, Basaha Trailer. Basaha founded and directed an independent school, administered a program to link resources of local universities with community needs, served on the board of the National Human Rights Groups, and chaired the boards of a children advocacy and grant maker organization. She is a 22-year veteran of philanthropy, 
and now a principal of Lift Every Voice LLC. She was awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship, the Arts Peters Memorial Fellowship in Journalism, and the Temple University Urban Fellowship. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Alina Bakers Rogers and Fasaha Trailer. Welcome, welcome, y'all. Hey, thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yes. to be y'all here. It's your so, energy. Well, thank you. Well, before we hop in this conversation, I need to give a disclaimer to all my co-conspirators watching out there. For my mom, mom, if you're watching this show and any of my elders watching, I've had direct requests from Dr. Rogers and Mama Fasaha. I am to call Dr. Rogers sissy in this conversation, and I'm not allowed to call Mama Fasaha mama anymore past this point, and I'm not allowed to call her miss, okay? So yes, I was raised right, y'all, but I also want to honor their request, so I don't need no elders coming from me in the chat, okay? <laughs> I don't need it. Talking about, um, you need to be saying miss and mama. I know, but y'all asked me not to, okay? So... Y'all gotta, right, y'all gotta right, protect right. me from the elders, child. Protect right, me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I want to start off, as I always do with my guests, about talking through you guys' journey in education. What pushed you guys to become educators? Mm. Wow, that is such a simple yeah. but great question. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think for me it was. Um, well, I had, I had always had a passion for reading and learning, and um, I pretty much knew in ninth grade that I wanted to be an English teacher because I loved reading and, and writing, and I uh, was pretty good at it. Uh, but I, th I think the, the, the critical point came for me when I found myself pregnant at 16, and my mom, not so much me, but my mom had decisions to make about you know what the immediate next portion of my life was going to be, and one of the one of the most important decisions she made was that I would continue to dream and to move towards my dream. So what that means is that somebody knows me. They're saying, "OMG, Dr. Rogers." <laughs> That's Mama Toya. That's Mama Toya. She's a faithful watcher of the show. Shout out to Mama Toya. <laughs> okay, Mama Toya. <laughs> Uh, and, um, you know, so for my mother, what that meant was that the village immediately, you know, took charge and, uh, you know, I stayed home for one year. Uh, my mother was in, in close contact with, you know, folks at Bartram High School and where I was a student. And, um, uh, you know, I stayed home one year, but ended up graduating in 11th grade. And it's, you know, pretty much all history from, from there. My mother knew nothing about you know, how to complete college applications or the FAFSA form or, or anything like that. But, um, you know, she she sat with me as much as she could to try to figure out those forms. And I will tell you that from that experience, the, the filling out the forms, the being a first generation, you know, college student first at Cheney State, uh, Cheney, it was Cheney State then, yeah. First mm -hmm. at Cheney State uh, and then, uh, realizing that was just too big of an of environment for me. I would live a very sheltered, you know, life and um, went to community college of Philadelphia. And, and that, you know, for me, having a, that experience as a first generation college student, a teenage mom, that actually was what propelled me into my work as an educator. And in fact, my first, my first job was as a director at the Center for Literacy, and you talk about the pipeline, the pipeline for me and, and my work started there with, you know, working with or, you know, supporting the tutoring and classroom instruction of folks who were in adult basic education and, and or GED classes, as well as workforce development classes and things like that. So all of the work that I have done since that time has touched the pipeline, has been about uh, you know, support services for a low income minority, uh, you know, or first generation college students. Uh, and then also later on, someone mentioned that I, that I know a Karen Newsom, she was one of my mentees and a teacher who worked for me when I was at Arcadia University. And then on, but my point in saying that is that helping black educators themselves move through that pipeline. That's right. Lifting as you climb, lifting yeah. as you climb. Yeah. Uh, but you have a strong story of like persistence. And 
I think that sometimes when we're talking about black women professionals, especially doctors and researchers, uh, people have this idea of what your pathway should look like or what your roadmap to get there should look like. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing that story and letting us know like everybody's roadmap looks different. Um, and it yeah. doesn't look all neat and beautiful and packaged. Um, right. But it is a beautiful journey and it is a beautiful story. Yeah, um, it has been. Yeah. For Saha. Hey. Okay. Well, what, what, I think that the thing that, that Sissy and I share, well, we share a lot of things, but one of the main things we share is a love of reading and writing. And I think that any educator who doesn't, you know, love learning and reading and writing, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that, but <laughs> you do. You um, just don't want to. But <laughs> <laughs> she already did. <laughs> um, you know, I sort of came into education as a uh, during a period in the country when the the focus in black communities was on building independent institutions, mm -hmm. and the one you know the idea that black people really needed to have institutions that believed in them, that encouraged them, uh, really led to our formation of Nita Musasa, African Free School, which was an independent black institution, you know, long before charters were even a gleam in anybody's eye. Um, it was an effort to say, you know, it was like like a direct, um, we were thinking that the folks who said, oh, they're poor, they're this, they, they can't learn, you know, we have to, you know, have all these excuses. And we were thinking, no, no, that is not where we are going. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we came from a tradition of, you know, people setting up schools out of nothing, you know, having like in Ruth Wright Hare story, having, uh, you know, having uh, schools set up in railroad cars. <laughs> so we were not we were not into that. And so we created Nitha Musasa and I was its founder uh, mm -hmm. and which was how I actually met. Uh, Sharif El Mekki when he was a little kid. <laughs> yes. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, planted, yeah. You, planted that, you planted that seed uh, for Big Sharif to grow into, into who he is today. Uh, we appreciate well, you for that. <laughs> whatever little part I had in it, I'm very proud of it. Um, and, you know, I, but I maintained my, uh, really, I, I was, I have always been a reader, a writer, a learner. Always. And, and that is true no matter where I was, whether I was in philanthropy, mm -hmm. whether I was in community-based work, whether I was in school-based work, uh, whether I was in, uh, you know, human rights work. It really didn't matter. That, that was the thing that I took to wherever I went. So, so both of you have led schools. So for me, I look at both of you as like architects of the Black teacher pipeline. You guys are out here leading and building nation. Um, but during those times, Mom Saha, that you're talking about, all Black schools like weren't popular. What inspired um, both of you to start and lead schools? Well, you know, for me, uh, it was it was really the time. It was the time. It was the you know the early 1970s. Um, that was a time when you know black people had just come out of the civil rights movement and it was all around us it was a question of okay what's the next step what do we need to do and you know our our desire was to demonstrate how it should be done um, and you know that was that was the inspiration you know the inspiration came from the community there were you know and especially in philadelphia in Philadelphia in the early 1970s, early 80s, it was really difficult educationally in Philadelphia. I guess it was difficult everywhere. I mean, in Boston, there was the school desegregation battles. In New York, there was there were um, you know community school battles. Hmm. Uh, in Philadelphia, there were strikes nearly every all the time. 
nearly every single year there was a strike and parents were beside themselves. It, it's mm -hmm. kind, it was kind of like it is now, you know, in the during the era of the pandemic when parents yeah. are like, ah, I can't, you know, about teaching their kids at home. I mean, it was a situation where black parents, especially in Philadelphia, were faced with months, I don't mean weeks or days, months mm -hmm. of teachers mm -hmm. being out on strike. And, you know, this was in part our response. We needed to take control of this mm -hmm. and create, you know, a setting where black kids could be educated um, as aside from the whole question of, you know, strikes and, you know, all of that. So, so that, you responded that to the call. A big impetus. Y'all responded to the call, responded to the needs of the community. We had to. It was one way of responding to the call, and it, and and we really felt that we had to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, and I want to just jump in and say uh, that that I was not a founder of schools in the way that uh, my colleague Fasaha has been. What I what I was uh, was a person who positioned herself to be the head of departments that were responsible for that work. So, you know, mm -hmm. as much as I was, you know, it's interesting because I think that sometimes when people think about higher education administration or higher education administrators, they don't necessarily think about the people whose work is focused on the kind of, the kind of efforts that I led, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and those were about bringing people, non-traditional people, you know, into, into the fold. Uh, Let's say it, black people, bringing black, black people, people. <laughs> bringing black people, bringing black people into the educational fold and providing the the daily, you know, hands on, all hands on deck support, whether it was academic support or social support connecting with the Department of Public Welfare or connecting with schools for, you know, for parents who are having issues with their kids or working with homeless homeless students, you know, which I did as well, not a stone's throw from where Fasaha lived. It was positioning myself to be able to uh, have an effective role, you know, with those, with those students. The other thing I wanna go back and say is that when I was at Bartram, a student at Bartram, I was in the human services program. Mm -hmm. And there was something about that program. I didn't even quite know what it was, but despite the fact that I was I was um, looked at by my white teachers as being, you know, a special, you know, a special uh, young black girl who should go on to college because I was unusual in that regard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you all know what I mean, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what I said was, I've, you know, so instead of going to, to John Bartram's School of Motivation, which was the track for college students, I chose to go to human services because something about that mattered to me. And I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure what, but I will tell you that by the time that I graduated from Widener University, from the School of Human Services Professions, <laughs> I was very clear. That. I was very clear on what that work was. And then the last thing I want to say is that the strikes in Philadelphia every year were crazy. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, I was always a, a bicyclist, and I re I remember when I first started at Cheney, I couldn't get to 69th Street. You know, and so what I did was I rode my bike to 69th Street every day and locked it up and then was able to board the the, the suburban buses that mm -hmm. took me further route. Because a lot of times it was the, the buses and the trains in the city, but the suburban rails and buses were still were still running. Okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that I just that's just a little bit of a yeah, so person take on what strikes was crazy here. So my other leading question into this is with with that happening, especially when we talk about black independent schools, what happened to black independent schools? Like hmm. those schools have a legacy um, in our communities of teaching and training some of the best leaders that we know now, like the Sharif El Meki. What happened to black independent schools? Well, you know, I think that um, I have a friend who's always saying, you know, that needs to be written about. That needs to be written about. But I think that there's there's a number of things that happened with black independent schools. Number one, 
I think that the economics of yes. running them was very, very difficult. Now, back in the days before charter schools, um, you know, it, it was like a matter of tuition, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, what we did at Nitha Musasa was we had, you know, a tuition plan and we had, uh, you know, a sort of barter system where people could come in and work and exchange for tuition and mm. et cetera, et cetera. But it, it ultimately became really something that could not, it just could not work that way. Okay. Because teachers need to be paid, you know, uh, and of course it, you know, it faded away after I left. But, you know, I think that the the economics of it was was just really they were brutal. They were and really you're, you're lifting up a really serious problem, like even that black charter leaders have today. Um, oh, yeah. The means and the resources to the actual financial and budget and finances that it takes to run a, a school um, mm -hmm. and access to wealth or access to people who have wealth, which then mm -hmm. leads into a whole nother conversation of access to people who believe in black children, who believe in black people, who believe in black need leaders enough to mm -hmm. actually invest um, in them. It's mm -hmm. always a topic of conversation around, especially around our current charters. Well, who do you have on your board or who are you getting to be able to like get money for you and things of that nature? But it, that's I an mean, important, that, yeah, that's an important consideration. And, and, you know, it might seem strategic in terms of, uh, you know, board development, but, in, but, but that, and that's because it is strategic. Mm -hmm. You know, and it has to be. Yes, it's extremely strategic. But when you are in these spaces and these places where you don't have access and you don't have connection, uh, which happens mm. a lot of time to our black folks, mm -hmm. you're going to have a financial strain on your institution. Um, and it's going to take Kuji Jacqueline to get you through. Right. You're going to have to keep fighting and finding yeah. and scrapping for it to happen. But that's an excellent point um, that you bring up for Sahara. And I just want to say that it also continues it's also at the, it's not just at that K-12 level, but it's also at the, the higher ed level as well. The HBCU um, level, we you know, know right now. Yes, you are hitting on an excellent, we know right now that HBCUs are struggling for funding. But, mm -hmm. but even, right, there, some of these are public institutions that should be getting more funding from federal or state or local governments, and they're just not. So yes, mm -hmm. it definitely continues on. Um, from K two into the collegiate space, without a doubt, and and even with uh, you know the again the, the the types of programs that I led were that they went into the category of special initiatives. So always looking for funding, you know, for you know for those types of programs, you know, is is really a challenge. So mm. definitely. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about they carry us and this book and this phenomenal work that you all did. But I want to start the conversation off just by talking about the title alone, because mm. I really want people to understand what that means. So when you say carried, they carried us. What are y'all making reference to? Mm. We are talking about the work these women did, the formative, elemental, foundational work that these women did. You know, whether they were working in, you know, community organization or movement activism or education or faith or the arts or sports or wherever they were working, mm -hmm. they did work that carried the whole community. Uh, and ultimately, because of that, carried parts of Philadelphia. Uh, and one of the things that we are you know, most intent on is making the city of Philadelphia acknowledge the work that these women have done. Absolutely. And you I, know, I the, the real quick and shout out, somebody asked about this. So I to to make, there we go. I just want to make sure I plug the book. So the poster, oh, let me get in the camera. The poster that is behind these two, both of these beautiful women yes. is the poster for their book. They carried us the social impact of Philadelphia's black women leaders. Excellent book. So if you get the opportunity, please go out and get that. Um, Dr. Roger, sorry for interrupting, but some, I just wanted to give y'all a plug real quick. <laughs> oh, well, we, we appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I almost forgot, you know, age age has a way of coming up on you. I almost forgot what it was I was going to say. Uh, but listening, listening to Fasaha, I don't know why, but Fasaha, this is the very first time when, when we've talked about the title, 
when the the song what just popped in my head was we're moving on up mm. <laughs> to the east side <laughs> to the yeah. yeah. apartment that that the pie. okay but, you know what's the part about us uh scraping in and crawling check what, what was that what was that is it the same song I don't know. Fist I don't know. Kitchen, fist on the front grill. No, I what know. I was going to say is that these women of they carried us. You know, they did the early, you know, the, they did the early scraping part. They did the, you know, that that mm. hard, that hard. That's where I'm going with that. You know, that hard mm -hmm. and you know, uh, evolutionary work. Uh, that uh, so you can imagine, you know, the work that that all of us, you know, do now in comparison to. When they had to do it, and and the social issues that they had to contend with, okay, I'll just say it: the racism and the discrimination, the uh, you know, and the and the sexism, you mm -hmm. know, that they had to deal with all of that pushback, you know, the the, the these early women, you know, they were persistent. So we yeah. wanted, you know, a title that really um, spoke to spoke to them. Uh, and spoke to their legacy uh, for us. Yes. Um, well, I'm just, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mama. Okay. I, mean, I just ahead. wanted. I just wanted to uh, just read a quotation. Now everybody knows about Fanny Jackson Coppin. Okay. Yes. I mean, every, you know, if you if you know anything about Cheney or the Institute for Colored Youth or whatever, you're always you know you the name Fanny Jackson Coppin is just you know it's there, out. but. I, you know, the thing that I think is most interesting is, you know, people think of, okay, this person was born in 1837, but mm -hmm. they had something, they had something with them, okay? <laughs> Fanny Jackson Coppin said, and, and I love, I love the shade of this quote, <laughs> it seems necessary that we should make known to the good men and women who are so solicitous, solicitous about yes. our souls and minds. Yes. Yes. That we haven't quite got rid of our bodies yet. And until we do, we must feed and clothe them. And this thing of keeping us out of workforces forces mm -hmm. us back into charity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, you know, that kind of, you know, she was clear eyed about what she was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, she was like, we need education because we need to be able to support ourselves and our communities. We gotta live. And yeah, we that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and and Gertrude uh Bastille Moselle, who uh herself was a teacher and an abolitionist and author, she actually wrote the 1894 book, The Work of Afro-American Women. She was in in, in her book, basically what she did was was it an early an, 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 an early shout out before there was such a thing that was called a shout out, you know? She did an early shout out to women who were, black women who were at, and black Philadelphia women who were at the forefront at the early stages of the movement to educate our people. And the list, the text lists uh, 19th century black Philadelphia teachers who have largely gone unnoticed. Julia Jones, Lottie Bassett, Frazilia Campbell, names, that's right. Peck Kiger, mm -hmm. Salon Yates, Susie Horter, Florence Cozen, Fanny Somerville, Molly Durham, and Ann Annie Marriott. Now, those are not all of the all of the women because it certainly includes those like Fisaha said, Fanny M. Jackson Coppin, Cordelia Jennings Atwell, and Carolyn LeCount. But the point mm -hmm. is made that, you know, just because we don't know of these women doesn't mean that they weren't there yes, exactly. and doing this hard work. Doing That's the right. spade work. Yes. <laughs> grinding, grinding at the bottom so that we you. have a tower to climb. Building Scrapping in and crawling. Yes, you still trying to I'm trying figure to figure out the words. <laughs> Hugging and loving, get with the kitchen. You still trying to figure out the words. Oh, I, so I get, I get stuck it. like that. Listen, it's fine. Coca Spirit is. If you know which line uh, Sissy is trying to refer to, please write it in the chat so we please. can know if it's please. from moving on up. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about. It might be from good times. I don't know. Oh, it could be. <laughs> it could oh, be. yes. 
a shuck and in a jive and good times. It is good times. Is it crawling south? What does Nora you, know? Come on, Nora. Is it singing, crawling south? You got me singing on air, child. Um, let all me. Right. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, fortunately, I will. I will not. You know, do that to you. You won't. You won't join in. You won't join in. <laughs> Let's get into this education section of the book. So as you know, we are out here trying to rebuild this black teacher pipeline and recruit more educators into the field. But at the same time, like lifting up the voices of black educators in this um, in this ecosystem. What can we learn from the journeys of the women that you wrote about to inform us now about rebuilding this black educator pipeline? Hmm. Well, let me let me just say one thing that, you know, I think that one of the reasons that, um, you know, that was identified really in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, one of the reasons that it's difficult to rebuild the pipeline really is from a good thing. And that is there was a time when Black women could only be teachers or nurses. Right. OK. They, there was a time like that. Hmm. And fortunately, you know, the, the whole landscape for what black women can do and be has opened up tremendously. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But what that what that means is that. I think that some of the work that the center is doing about lifting up the idea of being an educator, the revolutionary potential of that, you know, the community building potential of that. You know, people, people might not want to go into teaching uh, for their own personal benefit, mm -hmm. but people who are attracted to the idea that this is an important community effort, that this is a contribution that I can make that will make a long-term difference for people who I know and love, that I think is a big part of it, that, that we really do have to say that this is kind of a sacred profession. Mm -hmm. And this you know a what? Sacred profession. I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's and, and we've gotten away from that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, have. teaching has, you know, has, has, for whatever reasons, uh, has, you know, become this, this, you know, last thought, you yeah. know. Like, um, if I can't do anything else, I'll teach. I teach, I teach. Yeah. you know, um, and like, you know, like, I like to say to, to folks when, um, when, when they find out that, you know, I, I have a doctorate. Uh, you know, whether or not it's a lawyer, whether or not it's a medical doctor or a psychologist or anything like that, who I find myself speaking speaking with. What I'd like to say is, and it's because of those of us who worked in education that others were able to succeed. Think mm -hmm. about that, you know, mm -hmm. think, yeah. think about that. And that, you know, that's real important. Um, I'm, 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 and, and beyond that, I, I, I would like to ask you to, to, uh, state your question again because i think i have a really good response to it but i want to make sure i heard it do you so, remember what your question was <laughs> <laughs> yes so i was saying what can we learn from the journeys of in the section of education of the women that you guys wrote about what can we learn that will help us inform um our journey to rebuilding the black teacher pipeline because these women well, have done so much sure um, they have um I, you know we're you know we're talking about this you know those things that we previously previously said, and we need to use the word representation. I believe that representation matters. That you know, when 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 young black kids see us, you know, they could see themselves. Right. When 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 professional uh, black people, male or female, see us, leaders like us you know, they can see themselves. And that's one of the things that was really, um, to some extent, um, actually to a large extent, and still is the case, absent in higher education. And that's my, that's that's where I enter. So you always hear me talking about that piece of the pipeline, you know, that there were not many people who looked like me, uh, mm. you know, in those, in those uh, you know, upper level positions. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, when people, when when minorities are in black women and 
black men see people like me and see people like the Saha, I think that matters. Uh, the other thing that I think is, is that we have to have a large dose of this, and I'm going to read this. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a, this is a, a f written by a former law student of Phoebe Haddon, one of the women who's profiled in the education chapter of our book. And this student wrote to, to, uh, to Phoebe, Happy New Year. As the new year dawns, I am filled with gratitude. I would like to thank you for being a shining example in the embodiment of the childhood fantasy of an impoverished first generation student from the housing projects who fell out of place and overwhelmed in law school. I was a student in your race and law course at Temple Law. At 23, I was married with a toddler, just trying to drag myself to the finish line. I was all but convinced that I did not belong. That is, until I met you. There you were, poised, black, regal, and brilliant. Not just fitting in, but defining and redefining the space. We need a whole lot of that. Yes. And so these educators who are in your pipeline and pipeline Siri, you know, similar to yours, um, they are needed. They are necessary. And the more that work, uh, you know, continues again, like, you know, from the center and, and other entities, uh, you know, the stronger we can make this thing. Yes. And representation matters. Like you said, um, yeah. we talk all the time about windows and windows and mirrors. And we know that with the rate of educators right now, especially being 80 percent white and female in the K-12 space, our kids are getting a lot of windows looking out at other people's experience and seeing other mm. people in leadership, but not mm -hmm. seeing a lot of mirrors. They're seeing mm -hmm. themselves and the people who lead them and seeing an attainable goal that like I can be a teacher and I, too, can be a leader. So representation um, is definitely big. Yes. But um, I want you guys to talk about, um, from your perspective, why is teaching seen as a tool to uplift our race? Um, I think that that is, especially in the beginning of the education part of, of, of your book, as basically teaching, um, especially Black women have used that as a tool for uplifting our people. It's, it's, it, it, well, go ahead. I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, that goes way that goes way back beyond yeah. even 1619. That goes back to, you know, that it is not possible today to be able to succeed and flourish without education. Mm -hmm. And when I say education, I don't mean I mean being able to read, write, and think. The basics. Out. You know, if you're not able to do those things, then, you know, that there, there is really no hope for you to um, to really be able to succeed. And, and that and one of the things that I think is really important about us reclaiming is that that is a part of our tradition. It's who we are. That's yeah, right. That's that who is a we part are. Of our tradition. And we should not let anybody take that away from us, okay? Right, I mean, right. from, it, I don't care whether you're talking about Frederick Douglass or, you know, Fanny Jackson Coppin or, you know, whoever you're talking about. You know, there's always been a line. There's always been a theme, a through line about the importance of education and whether that was self-education, self-development, and in fact, I would say that one of the most important things that you get from studying Black history is that Black people have always seen freedom, not as liberty necessarily, but as development. Yes, yes. Freedom yes, has yes. always meant the capacity to yes. develop yourself, yourself into right. whatever you can become. Be. That's right, that's right. That's this, right. Uh, this notion of uh, you know the, ro the road to social uplift. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to uh, be able to, you know, fully participate in what happens with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, rather than having people act on you and upon you, but you being able to participate in that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will, I will say unequivocally that I am a strong uh, advocate 
for education. And I will push a young person to the brink of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if they don't get where I think that I know they can go, that's right. Okay, uh, you, you know what I'm saying. That in that, um, you and that's whatever that looks like. And, and quite frankly, it's taken me. You know, I've gone through a process of saying, okay, that you know, of of owning that not everyone goes to higher, no, not everyone goes to college. Mm -hmm. I I get that, but wherever it is, wherever it is that you intend to go. You're not going to get there without knowing how to read and write, uh, and do math, and, uh, and, and, and think, think, critical thinking, and 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 you know, and make and make strides in in this world of ours. Um, you know, that's in Philadelphia and beyond. Beyond the 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 um, the women of of they carried us. You know, again, well, what what we one of the things we haven't said is that. There was such a place for mothers in these women's lives. That's right. Okay. And, you know, to, you know, probably almost to a woman, they had mothers who, and fathers, but I'm talking about Black women right now, mm -hmm. you know, who, you know, were, you know, hell bent on, on their success. And again, whatever that looked like. A number of these mothers founded schools in the city of Philadelphia mm -hmm. and their daughters, you know, as you'll read in the chapter and their daughters, you know, followed became in their footsteps teachers. from the, you know, that's right. From the Fortin women to yep. the Bastille women, uh, you know, to the Jennings, you know, mm -hmm. on and on. And these schools were, you know, you know, there was, there was the, it was the Ohio unclassified school. There was the raspberry school. There was the Free African School for Girls and private homes. These women established schools in their homes. Their own homes. That's their right. Their own homes. Yep. Okay. And then, and of course, there was the Institute for Colored Youth. Yes. Which, which, which evolved into Cheney. In the university. Um, and and um, Black women had their hands all over that. All up in it. Cooking in all the pot. All up in it. Yeah, so we said we don't I have can't, a history and a legacy of education. Okay, we do, and that you know one of the and another thing is that you know Fasaya and I we were amazed at some point, and maybe we shouldn't have been, but we were, and I think that speaks to our lifelong learning. We were amazed to see these connections across not just a decades, you, you you know, but across centuries, these things that the women were fighting for and fighting against, you know, continued. We could talk about these early women, but then you know the other women who picked up the who picked up the torch were the were the Connie Claytons, you know, um, were the were the Ruth Ruth Ray Hairs, yes. yep. you know, and um, and other women, you know, in in, in the book as well. But you know, some people think that like black women feel. That it's our responsibility to carry the mantle for education. Do you think they feel that load? Uh, I think some do, I, yeah, and I, I do, think yeah. more should. I think some do, and I think, I think more, more should. And I would speak to that. that. Speak to that when you say more should. Well, you know, I think this goes back to the question of you know making this a crusade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that people. Um, there have always been occupations that people have um, really been drawn to that it's it, you're not drawn to them because you feel like you'll make a lot of money. Okay. Right. That's not why you're drawn to them. Right. Okay? Right. You're drawn to right. them because of the intrinsic feedback about the importance of what you're doing, your right. love for the people that you're serving. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that, you know, that we need to rekindle some of that, you know, and, and part of rekindling it is not just saying to, you know, any individual, you know, you should feel like this is a crusade. It's about out here in the community, out in the churches, the mosques, you know, wherever, wherever we are congregating. We need to be elevating teachers. We need to be saying, this is an important occupation and this is what you should do. 
And right. you know, we have we have to create an atmosphere where um, where young people sense that this is a valued occupation. That's right. I mean, I think you make a fantastic point. In some of my research and with us trying to build this Black Educator Pipeline, I am finding that this profession is not attractive to young people. It's not yeah. marketed to young people um, in a way that they see it as obtainable or something that they even want to do. Um, right. The, the concern that I have, though, is that this is the way that this profession is treated in our community. Because yeah. as we can see, young white women are coming into the profession in droves, feeling like it's mm -hmm. their civic duty to save um, black children. Um, you have some who are down to be, you know, abolitionists and liberators with us in this movement, but there's a large majority of them that feels like it's their civic duty to save the black child. But mm -hmm. for some reason, we're not pushing to our own children and black children. It's just civic duty to be, to have responsibility in your own community. We're not here to save well, anybody. It's, yeah. it's your, your, your duty to help, to be yeah, a part, I a contributor to your community. I really want to jump in on that because yeah, um, get I, in, get in. I, you know, I, I I taught on that topic quite a bit uh, when uh, when I was at Arcadia. Again, uh, my students were graduate and doctoral level uh, education students, and one of the one of the one of the texts that um, I used was was a, and it's interesting because I mentioned this yesterday. The text uh, essential conversations by uh, Sarence, uh, Professor Sarence Lor uh, Lawrence Lightfoot. This, this book grappled with the connections and relationships or lack thereof between schools and parents. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the fact that, primarily the fact that over time, schools had become this uh, enemy, almost in a way, for lack of a better word, that, that, you know, parents were always being, you know, you know, only called when their kids were doing something wrong or bad, or that, you know, they were, they were being, you know, talked down to, uh, that there essentially was not a relationship based on the best interests of the child that existed between schools and parents and especially blacks uh, black parents and their in their their children's schools so you know over over time we've seen this this divide um develop really that you know you know you know black parents send their kids to schools to school because that's the thing that they're supposed to do um and and not so much as much as we should but you know the school is not the place where they can get support and understanding themselves and i do think that that has a part in what we're seeing now that oh, relationships I, between parents and schools has got to be rebuilt it has yeah. to be stronger it has to be better and school leaders have to see parents as partners and mm -hmm. not as um customers that you're providing a service to or customers who don't even deserve a superb service right because I when I was in schools, I would have to tell people like we are of service to parents. <laughs> like right, but the other thing is that we have to demand that. We Agreed. have to oh, you know, parent we have to demand that. We just like, this 100%. is this is I am not tolerating anything less less for <laughs> my child. For my child. That's right. That's right. So I want to get into this question. Um and then we can go back to some other things if we have time. But I want to play a game with you guys called Education Pipeline Squad. So from your book in that educator chapter, if you had to pick three women oh, come from on. the book to start a school with, three women ah, from that book to start oh. a school with, who would it be and why? I mean, well, the if one of them, one of them would have to be Nellie Rathbone Bray. Okay. She was a principal of a Germantown school and even before Carter G. Woodson came up with Negro History Month, she decided that she was going to have all of the most, you know, interesting and important and inspiring people come to her school on a regular basis because she believed that if Black kids knew something about Black history, 
that it would help them educationally. She had Marian Anderson in there. She had Roland Hayes in there. She, I mean, she brought people in there on the regular to try to, you know, let people know that whatever it is that you're seeing right in front of your face is not the horizon. The horizon mm. is out there. And I want to show you what it is. Mm. She's one. So well, that, yeah, that was one. Yes, that was yeah, one. Three. That was one. Uh, Doc, Dr. Roger, you could go next. We don't have oh, to come go on. on the road, we don't have to do it all in order. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I can't go anywhere uh, without Ruth right here. Yes, that's my pick. But go okay, ahead. I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Let me tell you something. I have never talked to so many grown folk as the women who are interviewed in this book who talked about their teacher, Ruth right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I mean, grown women. Mm -hmm. I remember when Dr. Hare, da, 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 and this woman left such an impression. This educator, this educator left such an impression that mm -hmm. so many other women mm -hmm. became educators. educators. And yeah. that's what we're talking about. Yes, yes, you know that's what we're Ruth talking right about. Right here was out here knocking down doors, Look, to get to places, know? building nations, inspiring people, and taking droves of people with her that's through right. this movement. That sister would she would be one of my picks. Most that's definitely. right. You know, um, so yeah, there you go. Go on for side. Who else you got? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I want to hear who else you got. Okay, let me. Well, let me. You know, I, I have taken to uh, checking up. Um, Connie Clayton. Okay. Yep. Every every you know every few She's weeks. She's on my list. She's on my honorable <laughs> mention. She's on my honorable <laughs> mention. But yes, Connie and Clayton. She, and the you know the reason that that Connie is on my list is that number one, if you mention her name to a certain age student in Philadelphia, <laughs> I mean the first thing that comes up with Connie Clayton is. No clothes, Clayton. No clothes. I was going to say that. Come on, you stole that from me. <laughs> you know, because no, and and what was important about that was not just that she would hardly ever close the schools for any reason. <laughs> that 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 was you know that was important, and of course none of the kids liked that, but she <laughs> knew it was important. Mm -hmm. But what was important was that was what that communicated <clears throat> to kids about their capacities what was needed, what was necessary. And she always tagged that with the kids come first. Or it was about the success of our children. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, that, that was her focus. She looked through that lens, whenever she, whatever she was doing, that was the lens she looked through. And that's, I mean, so many people you know, they're more worried about, you know, what the mayor is going to say or what the whoever is going to say. Not her. My sis. What's mm -hmm. good for the kids. the kids. Okay. And so I just, you know, I, I think that she is not given nearly the kinds of accolades that she deserves. I really, I really, really, I mean, even though many people have recognized her for lots of stuff, but I think that she was sort of like the last, the last superintendent who unified Philadelphia around education. Mm -hmm. They got the people going. They got the people invested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add that she was on my list for all those reasons, and because um, I'm just going to say it, she didn't take no stuff, and you <laughs> no. need somebody like that. Mm -hmm. You yes. need some, I mean, from an administrative standpoint, you know, for all those out there who might be interested in one day becoming an administrator of, of uh, education in some way, you need to be tough and you need to be sure and firm about why you're there. Mm -hmm. She was mm -hmm. false. Yeah, and see, and see, <laughs> no, and I think that the important thing about that is not just that she she ran the show. I mean, that was that was very important, but she ran the show on behalf of some values. Right. Some values right. about the kids. Right. And lots of people didn't like it. Yeah. Okay. She knew what she was doing. She knew yeah. what she was doing. Yeah. Okay, so I would also add um, uh, Cordelia Jennings Atwell. Because okay. 
I, I, you know what? I'm just going to say I would roll with her any day because she could touch something and make it happen. If she wanted a school to be there, it was there. If she wanted kids to be there, it was there. Whether or not it was in her mother's living room or moving the kids out of her mother's living room and setting them up in a school or, you know, her own school or, or folding them into, you know, the, the Philadelphia schools at that point and in hiring other graduates from the Institute for Colored Youth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. you know, she didn't go, she didn't go somewhere else, you know, and find teachers. You know, she had, as far as I'm concerned, homegrown teachers, teachers. you know, yeah. for her homegrown students. So, you know, I would take Cordelia, yeah, any day. Can I read something about these women? Yeah. So this is the last uh, chapter in uh, the education, uh, the introduction to the education chapter. And it says, following are the life stories of these determined women who were not only educators, but in every case, civic and community activists. That's mm -hmm. also what we need in our educators. So important. They represent the enslaved, freeborn, working and elite women hell bent yes. on educating their sisters and brethren for the purpose of social uplift by becoming teachers and establishing schools, literary associations, and philanthropic bequeaths for educational advancement, and on and on. So, I mean, that's that's fire. That is you fire. Know, that's that's fire. fire. That's and that's school activism pipeline right there. Exactly. Okay, that is exactly. telling you like I'm not just in here teaching just to be teaching. This isn't just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is about social uplift. Like we are here right. to impact the right. race, right? right? Like that is that is our existence. But seeing teachers, especially black teachers, in their fullness and in that role, and what it really means, especially in today's society, right? Because we are at war, um, trying to protect our children. Mm. So. Mm -hmm really talking about what that means to be a black teacher in today's society and how revolutionary um that is teachers don't get painted in that light and no, the call no, is put out to young black people in the way that you just illustrated on what you represent and who you are by entering the education field so i mean yes. that, that is fire and that is so deep um um the way it was written so ladies, we are actually coming up on time. But what I always like to give my guests a chance to do is give a final word. Um, if there's anything you want to say out there to the co-conspirators watching right now, um, or any final message you would like to leave us with, um, I'll give you guys the floor. Go ahead, Sissy. You you start. It you know, for me, it's for me, it's really plain and simple, uh, or sounding at least. But we're not gonna make it we as a black community are not gonna make it until more of us get back into the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I used to really struggle with, with, with that belief um, because it meant that other people weren't good enough you know, teaching us. Well, the fact of the matter is that we need us. In today's world, as chaotic and crazy as it is, uh, you know, with all the racism and you know, social divide and all that, we need us back in the classroom. Yeah. And and that's just again, it's not the K twelve, but it's also the college level uh, classrooms as well. And and yeah, you know, I actually I'm putting what is that expression? But I'm putting my I'm doing the same thing right now. I'm not just saying it, um, but I'm mm -hmm. doing it, and it's hard, you know, being a sub at a high school. Man, oh man, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But it's you know it's important work. Well, what I'm going to say is something that I said um, to my daughters this morning, and that is we really need, I, th this is a very specific ask. I hope that all over the city of Philadelphia this summer, there are going to be myriad efforts to beef up what children can learn over the summer mm. in preparation for schools reopening in September. I hope that, you know, the summer freedom schools, that, you know, community organizations, that universities, I hope that there are multiple ways and multiple sites for children who have been I don't know what you would call our pandemic pedagogy, 
Okay. I don't know <laughs> what, what you would call that. But surviving in these streets, child. Really, but <laughs> it's not enough. It is not enough. And we and I want to say that I would volunteer a couple hours a week in any such effort. Mm. Appreciate you, Mama Fasaha. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Oh, look at but look at your face because I was about to get a beer. Oh, sorry, Fasaha. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody out there for joining me with with, with, with Fasaha and Sissy today um, in our conversation. Please go out and get their book. They carried us. You can also find them on all social media, social media networks under um, the title "They Carry Us." Um, as always, I want to thank you for watching and participating with us today. If you enjoyed today's show, even if you didn't, <laughs> like, share, <laughs> and please comment. As always, I want to plug the Census Freedom Schools Literacy Academy. We still have applications open for rising first to third graders out there and any college students and high school students who are interested in teaching. Um, you can find us at www.thecenterblacked.com. Dot org. So please uh, check out our freedom schools. And as always, thank you today for watching. I'll see you here next week live at 12 p.m. for Building the Black Education.